Greetings, believers and non-believers. This is Rabid Ape replying to a video from Philo71 called Five Questions Every Intelligent Atheist Must Answer or something like that. And uh, there are actually a number of pretty blatant fallacies and misconceptions in this video, but I'm kind of skimming over those for now. Um, in consideration of time constraints and such. Uh, I started my next semester at college today, so uh, yeah, don't have a lot of time for production value and stuff. Um, the, the, the fallacies, I, I do want to address those, so please continue to check the description box over here and or just watch this channel. Maybe I'll make a second video. I don't know, we'll see. <clears throat> Without further ado, question number one. Are you, that's me, are you using chance in the same way that you accuse Christians of using God of the gaps? And my answer to that is going to have to be no. At least I don't think so. Uh, I'm not sure how you think I'm using chance uh, regarding God of the gaps. Uh, basically, that's where you take anything that science or people don't have an answer for and, you know, so, how does this thing happen, or why is that? We don't know. Aha! God did it! You know, God of the gaps. So every time, that every gap in our knowledge, you know, that's that's where God lives. Uh, unfortunately, those gaps are growing smaller and smaller and smaller, so God's kind of shrinking back, and, and you can kind of see that as, you know, you look at history. But anyway, uh, you know, so you might ask something like, why is the fine structure constant 1 over 137.035999907 instead of 1 over 137.62598675309? You know, because God made it that way? You see, the reason it's not valid, uh, at, at least for me, you know, like as an answer, answer uh, is because it doesn't actually explain anything. Uh, it's answering one mystery with another mystery, which in terms of knowledge gained or uncertainty eliminated, leaves you exactly where you started. So, you know, uh, Occam's razor, I guess, would just say cut the middleman. The only time chance should be part of an answer is in explaining something like the seemingly perfect fit between us and the planet Earth. But, there are trillions of stars in the observable universe, and we have good reason to believe that most of them, or at least a lot of them, will have planets around them. Link. Uh, life could only arise on planets with favorable, uh, favorable conditions, but given the sheer number of planets available, it is reasonable to conclude that some, at least, would have what it takes to harbor life. This line of thinking does not explain how the stars or planets got there in the first place. We have other theories for that. But says that given the sheer number of them, the fact that one just happened to have the right conditions by chance, if you will, isn't surprising. Um, I could roll six six-sided dice, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. I've got six of them. Uh, and there's only a one in 46,656 chance of getting any particular combination, but I'll get one of them every single time. So, uh, yeah. That doesn't explain where the dice came from, but it's not expected to. Now, there's plenty we don't know about the origin of life, what the original replicator was made of, or how the first cell formed, but the fact that we don't have an answer for everything does not mean that we need to automatically inject some magical wonder stuff where we don't have solid answers. If I don't know something, I'll say that I don't. If I have a good idea, but I'm not certain, I'll say so. And if the evidence is so overwhelming so as to render a given conclusion virtually unassailable, as in the case of the Big Bang or the theory of evolution by natural selection, I'll say so. Number two. Why should there be something instead of nothing? This is actually the seemingly inevitable dilemma of the theoretical physicist. 
even if human beings discovered and confirmed an ultimate theory of everything and reduced the workings of the entire cosmos to a finite set of mathematical laws, there would still be the question of why these laws and not some other ones. Why is there something instead of nothing? I don't know, but neither do you. <laughs> if even if God, whatever that might be, if God is ultimately responsible for everything that we can observe, that would still leave the question of why there is a God, that would be something, right? Instead of no God or anything else, nothing. So, yeah, that's, it's, it's an interesting question. Yeah, it can keep you up at night, but I, I dare say none of us has a good answer to that. Um, if you disagree, let me know. Question number three. Where do you get your morals from? The same place you do. <laughs> my brain and my body reacting with and learning from the environment and their experience. And, you know, there's, there's no magic ingredient necessary to explain it, and uh, number four, you're kind of asking the same thing. I mean, yeah, I would say, you know, I got them from my uh, evolutionary history, I guess. And then number four, how did morals evolve? Hey, all right, so uh, what is a moral anyway? <laughs> if you mean a principle or habit with respect to right or wrong conduct, I still don't see why you need anything other than a brain and a body both of which are addressed by natural selection. Um, if you want to be a little more specific, uh, we have the theory of kin selection, um, I mean, the, the theory, I don't know. Um, but basically uh, that idea says that, you know, like the genes in your body selfishly acting in their interest, and those are all scare quotes there, uh, but yeah, if you're looking at evolution as the, um, as competition between genes you know, trying to replicate in the gene pool, uh, and they accomplish that by building bodies that are good at surviving and reproducing those genes. Um, so those genes act in their interest by programming us with the tendency to care for other creatures or organisms who likely share a lot of genes with us, such as our relatives. So uh, if, to the extent that you have a way of discerning who your relatives are, um, it makes evolutionary sense, so to speak, for uh, that tendency to be built into there. Uh, and uh, you also have the concept of reciprocal altruism, and uh, that's just a fancy way of saying, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. And uh, through that, you can have moral tendencies between unrelated, because, you know, we're all related, to a way, in a certain extent, so, you know, th those uh, definitions are context-sensitive, but, uh, but, yeah, moral tendencies between unrelated individuals can be explained in, uh, in terms of reciprocal altruism, uh, because a gene that leads to uh, selfish organisms, that gene could die off if the organisms aren't cooperating or, you know, or fighting all the time so much. <laughs> that there aren't, they aren't as productive in passing on more copies of those genes, and uh, the whole lot is worse off than if they work together. So uh, a gene can be selfish by programming its carriers, you know, the, the body that it's running around in, uh, by causing the, the bodies, the individuals, to be altruistic towards each other. Um, if there are copies of that gene, or those genes collectively floating around in those different bodies, then, uh, yeah, gene selfishness leads to altruism in individuals. So um, that's, a, that's an example of how, yeah, you can get your morals from evolution. Uh, the fact that you can explain how they get there doesn't make them any less real. You know, just, just like the fact that I know looking at a rainbow, you know, it's pretty and everything. Uh, but, I, you know, I know that it's caused by light being diffracted through droplets on water doesn't make it any less pretty. The fact that I know food tastes good to me because that's part of our evolutionary past and, you know, if poop tastes good, 
then I would probably be more likely to get sick and die. So it makes sense for my genes to program my poop not to taste good and food to taste good, but that doesn't stop me from enjoying a good meal or having my stomach turn if I go into an, a poorly maintained public restroom, you know? So what is and what ought to be are not necessarily the same thing. So yeah, maybe our moral tendencies are arbitrary, just like our sense of taste and color and, you know, that's, uh, doesn't have to be a bad thing. I can already see it now, even if, uh, Philos isn't going to say this, I don't know if he's going to respond or not, but, uh, I know there's going to be comments, but without an absolute standard of morality, you could just do whatever you want. Anything could be justified from murder to rape, and by doing that, you've got at, at least one of two fallacies going, um, if not more, you know, let me know if you got some. <laughs> Uh, but uh, one, you're affirming the consequent. Uh, you're basically, you're taking it for granted, one, <laughs> that there is such a thing as an absolute standard of morality. And then saying, you know, the fact that evolution doesn't account for one invalidates the theory. So first you need to tell me why there should be one in the first place. And then in addition to that, you are also, you've got an appeal to consequences where you're saying basically X is undesirable, therefore X is not true. You know, if, if our moral inclinations come from our evolutionary past, then that's a bad thing because there's no absolute standard, da 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 da. I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing because it doesn't have anything to do with whether or not that's true. But actually, yeah, I don't think it's a bad thing, so. It is what it is. We're not the center of the universe. Sorry. But number five. Um, can nature generate complex creatures? Da -da 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 -da. Hasn't it? Aren't we here right now? And what I'm really interested to see, um, in a way, I guess in another way I'm not interested at all, but, uh, uh, you know, these, these arguments are kind of interesting, but I still I don't see how you can get to anything further than a deistic kind of God from this. Uh, you know, how do you get from there is a creator of some kind to, you know, Jesus is his son and the Bible is the inerrant, word that, you know, he has left behind for us and the entire universe was created with us in mind and, you know, you, you, you claim to know all these things about the mind of God and, you know, maybe you're not doing it in this video, but uh, uh, that's the part that interests me most. Because, yeah, why is there something instead of nothing? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I'm still waiting to hear why Yahweh is a more likely answer than the flying spaghetti monster or the matrix or anything else. Um, I honestly think either of those is more likely to be true than Yahweh. Uh, I would bet money on it. I'm not sure how you would collect, but uh, if anyone figures out a way, let me know. <laughs> I'll take the red pill. That system is our enemy. But when you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system, that they will fight to protect it. Were you listening to me, Neo? Or were you looking at the woman in the red dress? I was... Look again.